Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven, to offer unto him, through our Lord Jesus Christ, our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love, and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, in silence, let us remember God's presence with us now. O God, our Father, we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved thee with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. Have mercy upon us, we beseech thee. Cleanse us from our sins, and help us to overcome our faults. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant unto us pardon and remission of all our sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back to the Queen's College Virtual Chapel for our last service this term. We very much hope it will also be the last time that our Sunday evening service is in the form of a pre-recorded video and that from next term we will be able to worship together in the chapel and live online. Many, many thanks to everyone who has contributed to the online worship this term and please do keep the chapel and the college in your prayers as we prepare for whatever next term may bring. All of this term we've been reflecting on the theme of creation justice, what our faith in a creator God might have to teach us about our response to the challenges facing our natural environment and placing that response in the wider context of doing justice to other people and communities across the globe, as well as to the other species with which we share this planet. Tonight's readings confront us with God's direct injunction to act with justice and compassion to those in need, both as individuals and in the structures and the laws of our society. And to help us reflect on those themes, we're joined by someone with direct experience of translating green priorities into practical action within the constraints of the real world. Jo Chamberlain is National Environment Officer for the Church of England, a post she took on just before the first lockdown, and in the same month that General Synod called on the church to work towards a 2030 target for net zero carbon emissions across its over 16,000 buildings. So thank you to Jo for joining us virtually tonight. Let us pray. Grant, we beseech the Almighty God, that we who for our evil deeds do worthily deserve to be punished, by the comfort of thy grace may mercifully be relieved, through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. The first lesson is from Deuteronomy 24. When you make a loan of any kind to your neighbour, do not go into the house to get what is offered to you as a pledge. Stay outside and let the neighbour to whom you are making the loan bring the pledge to you. If the neighbour is poor, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your possession. Return their cloak by sunset, so that your neighbour may sleep in it. Then they will thank you, and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy. Whether that worker is a fellow Israelite, or a foreigner residing in one of your own towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset, because they are poor and they are counting on it. Otherwise they may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice, or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from here. That is why I command you to do this. When you are harvesting in your field, and you overlook a sheath, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from the trees, 
Do not go for the Brontes a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. That is why I command you to do this. Here ends the first lesson. The second lesson is from Matthew chapter 25. When the Son of Man comes in all his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, for you, you are accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or in sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Here ends the second lesson. Thank you for inviting me to share with you this evening. When Catherine's invitation came in February last year, I didn't envisage that I would be joining you by sending a video. Catherine contacted me just as I started my role as the National Environment Officer for the Church of England, so you can see I'm a year in. Before that, I was the Diocesan Environment Officer for the Diocese of Sheffield, where I live, and I worked for Christian Aid in their church engagement team. And it's my involvement with Christian Aid that has led me to environmental issues. Fundamental to the work of Christian Aid is a seeking after justice, supporting the poor and transforming the systems that keep people poor. 
As I'll explore more later, the impact of climate change on the poorest communities in the world is already devastating, making climate change an issue of justice, one of those oppressive systems in need of transformation. So the thread I want to unravel, which runs through both of the readings we've heard this evening, is justice. The passage in Deuteronomy sets out some of the ways people should deal with each other. And there's a clear difference between what you might be entitled to and what you should actually avail yourself of. The pledge given as a guarantee for a loan should be returned overnight in case your neighbour needs it, even though you're entitled to hold on to it. Workers should be paid fairly, even though you could easily rip them off when they're desperate. And the one I'm especially interested in, leave the sheaves you drop, the olives or grapes you miss. Let someone else pick them, someone who is needier than you. Yes, it's your land, your crop, you're entitled, but leave it anyway. Here God sets out a fundamental principle in our relationship to the land, to creation, to God's gift to us. It's not here for us to wring out every last drop. It's not here to be exploited until it has given up every last thing it could offer. It is given to all for the good of all so that all people may flourish. And we can extend this principle to cover all the creatures who live on the earth, even all the plants and other living things. Creation is a gift, not an entitlement given so that everything on earth might flourish. If we're taking more of the earth's resources than leaves enough for others to have enough, then we are taking too much, however legitimate we believe our claim to those resources might be. And as we'll see later, this applies to our carbon emissions too. The passage in Matthew takes the themes further. Here, Jesus isn't saying that we earn our way to a right relationship with God through our actions. But he is saying that our faith, our discipleship, is revealed in our actions. Jesus is explaining that our faith is revealed in how we treat the least of our brothers and sisters. Our responsibility is to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, tend the sick and visit the prisoner. A responsibility to our fellow human. Because these acts of service for those in need are acts of service to Jesus himself. They're worship, if you like. For me, these are the principles that drive my response to climate change. They're the principles that mean Christians and the church have no other choice than to act to tackle climate change. Principles that make reducing carbon emissions a fundamental part of discipleship. There are other reasons, but these are the ones that drive me. It is part of our worship, the outward expression of our faith, to care for those in need, to see that their needs are met. Elsewhere, Jesus teaches that our concept of neighbour has to be bigger than the person next door. In the church today, we understand this to mean that all of humanity is our neighbour and that the least of our brothers and sisters live all over the world. Some of our global neighbours who live in the greatest need are already living through the devastating impact of climate change. The poorest communities in the world are being hit the hardest. Droughts, storms and floods are often worst in communities that are already poor, in countries that are already poor. On top of that, governments and communities in these countries don't have the resources to prepare for disaster or to recover from it afterwards. But most unjust of all, these communities have contributed the least to the carbon emissions that have caused the breakdown in the climate and yet are suffering first and worst. The rich countries, who are the biggest emitters, have resources to adapt and are not yet feeling the full impact of the changing climate. We have not treated the earth as a gift, but have exploited it for all it's worth. And we continue to take up way more than our share of carbon emissions without really suffering the consequences. So the church cannot sit back and say, all this environmental stuff's nice if you like that sort of thing. For to do so is to see the Lord hungry and in need and not to offer help. It is to allow suffering to continue without recognising or doing anything about the part we are playing in the continuation of that suffering. It is to allow the exploitation and breakdown of God's gift of creation, but to leave it to a small group of people to do something about it. Because climate change is fundamentally an issue of justice. And if the church stands for anything, it must stand for justice. That's all the big stuff. That's the stuff that inspires me and keeps me going. Because when we get down to making a response, we can sometimes get lost in the numbers and the detail. So it's important to lift my eyes up and see the bigger picture and remind myself why it all matters and then be encouraged to keep going.
So part of the church's response to this demand for justice in the face of climate change has been to set itself a goal to reduce carbon emissions year on year, aiming to reach net zero by 2030. It's ambitious, but after lots of debate, it's deliberately ambitious. The church believing that it needed to set a bold, prophetic target, demonstrating that it's serious about action and acting as a model for others to follow. It was rather daunting to watch this decision being taken at General Synod during my second week in the job, but the decision makers were right. The target has inspired others to follow suit and change the standing of the church in the eyes of others. But before we get too complacent, there's still plenty of work to be done. I was brought up short last week by a new report published by Tear Fund called Burning Down the House. Research carried out among young Christians reveals that issues of justice really matter. More than 90% of those surveyed care about discrimination, poverty and climate change. But less than 10% believe that their church is doing enough about climate change. I felt rather indignant. We've set a target of zero emissions by 2030, don't you know? But clearly they don't know. We haven't communicated this widely enough. And if they do know about the target, maybe they still think we're not doing enough. So there's a job of work to be done to get this conversation going in every church, every parish, every church school, every Oxford College chapel, that creation care and action to tackle climate change belong in our worship, in our discipleship, in our life together as Christians. There's also a job of work to be done to work out quite how we're going to bring our emissions down as close to zero as we possibly can, and then work out how to offset the rest. And it's when I'm thinking about energy audits and church heating systems that I need to remember that all this is part of our striving for justice. So what have we managed to achieve in the last year and what are we going to do next? And what can you do? We've set ourselves a big goal and we need to work out what to measure and how to measure it. We're included in our target the things that the church as an institution is directly responsible for, heating and lighting our buildings, and that includes churches and church halls, church schools, cathedrals, diocesan offices, theology colleges and clergy houses. It also includes what we would count as work travel. We can't directly change the carbon footprint of all the people who attend church, but by raising the issue up the agenda, we can encourage people to think about their own footprint too. But how do you measure the carbon footprint of approximately 16,000 churches? The answer is to start with energy bills. Our amazing research and stats team created a tool where a church treasurer can type in how much energy the church has used, taken from their gas and electricity bill, and the tool converts that number into the number of tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, or a carbon footprint. Sometimes a number doesn't mean much, so it also gives the church an energy efficiency rating from A to G, just like the energy rating on your fridge or washing machine. And in order to recognise that bigger churches with more activities happening will use more energy, it uses other other information to give you the same energy rating per person hours. In the first year, about a quarter of churches filled in their data, and that was enough to help the stats team make a sensible estimate about the carbon footprint of all our churches, which is 185,000 tonnes. A lot. But 12.5% less than the last estimate in 2006. We also discovered that about 5% of churches can already be counted as net zero emitters because their building runs entirely on electricity and they have switched to a renewable tariff. And this shows us the way forward. The first part is easy. Every church should make sure that they are using a renewable energy tariff. If that happened, we'd save another 36,000 tonnes of carbon. The second part is the big challenge that lies ahead of us. How do we heat our churches without burning gas? Actually, this is a much bigger challenge than just for the church. It's one that the whole country is facing. Even with a UK target of net zero by 2050, one of the keys to reaching that target will be finding a way to heat all our homes, offices, schools, hospitals, universities, without using oil, coal or gas. In the meantime, in the church, we've carried out energy audits to find the best way to reduce the energy we consume in the first place. And the place to start is the basic stuff, the building maintenance, stopping drafts, clearing gutters, fixing broken windows. This feels a very long way from the issues of justice we started with this evening. 
but getting the most appropriate draft excluder fitted to your medieval church door is an act of worship and a step forward for justice. So you can see we've made progress for churches and now we need to do the same for schools, cathedrals, offices, theology colleges and homes. Just a small task then. Something that's really encouraged me over this year is the willingness of dioceses and churches and schools to keep moving forward on this journey, despite the impact of the pandemic. Resources may be stretched, but coronavirus has made this seem, work seem more urgent, not less. It has also brought into focus the accompanying ecological crisis of habitat loss and species extinction. One of the key parts of my job is helping the whole church to engage with this issue, not just the environmentalists or activists, but every person in every pew or online. One of the best things I found for helping people to engage is the Eco Church scheme run by Arosha UK. To earn your bronze, silver or gold award, the church has to be active across five areas, worship and teaching, buildings, lands, community engagement and lifestyle. Again, this helps to join the dots between audits and worship, radiators and justice. It brings into focus the lifestyle behaviour changes of the whole congregation, which will have an even bigger impact than the church's own target. Arosha UK have also set up an Eco Diocese Award. Three quarters of dioceses have now registered, up from half in May, and 12 of those have been awarded a bronze award, up from seven last May. And there are some silver awards coming soon. So that's what I've been doing. What can you do? As a college, I see that you've won a gold award for green impact already. But I wonder, as a chapel community, whether you could work towards an eco-church award. There'd be an overlap on land and buildings, but there'd be new things like global and community engagement and worship and teaching. Then as individuals, what can you do? What steps have you taken to reduce your carbon footprint? Do you even know what your carbon footprint is? That's a great place to start. There's lots of tools on the internet that will calculate for you and then give you a suggestion on how to reduce it. Try the, www, uh, try the WWF one for starters. Too many Ws. Something every individual can do is the same as something every church can do, and that's switch to that renewable energy provider. Or you could ask your landlord if you don't pay your own bill. The carbon calculators will give you more ideas, but I will defer to someone you've heard from already. Ruth Valeria preached at my church a few years ago and she suggested the top two things all of us could do to reduce our carbon emissions. One was fly less, so we've all been brilliant at that this year. The other was to eat less meat, which seems a very appropriate thing to suggest in Lent. I really wish I could have been here with you in person to talk about more practical things. If you want to be in touch, Catherine can share my email. We're making progress. Be encouraged. There is more to do, much more. But as Jesus said, whatever you do for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you do for me.
let us pray. God, our Creator, we thank you for this earth, our home. We give thanks with all those who have received abundantly of the earth's riches. And we pray in grief and remorse, along with those who have borne the greatest burden of its barrenness and destruction. We commend to you, Lord, this season of reflection on creation justice, which we've tried to share together. This small offering of curiosity and intention. Protect and nurture the fragile seeds which have been planted in us, the questions, the challenges, the inspirations and hopes. Help us make room for them in our hearts, that over time they may bear fruit in our own lives and the life of the college. God, our Redeemer. In this season of Lent, we become mindful of the tangle of our lives, that our sin and suffering is tied up with the sin and suffering of the world that purity of heart is too often thwarted by the grubby complexities of real life, that our salvation is not complete whilst others are bound and burdened. And as we mark International Women's Day tomorrow, we're mindful of how the burden of our collective hardship has further tipped the scales of inequality and injustice of all kinds. Father, we know we face unenviable decisions, as communities, nations and individually, that as we seek to distribute resources fairly and use them effectively, those resources are simply less than once they were. Protect us from that fear which drives us to seek security at the expense of others. God, our comforter, we thank you for this term that is now coming to an end, with all its limitations and frustrations and griefs, And as we look toward Easter and new life, we ask that you will take and transform and transfigure all that we have gone through, all that we have experienced together and apart, that the way of the cross may truly be the way of resurrection to new life. Almighty and everlasting God, who hatest nothing that thou hast made and dost forgive the sins of all them that are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of thee, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Thank you to everyone who has been following Creation Justice 2021. Our final speaker event is on Tuesday, rescheduled from earlier in the term, Environmentalism and the Gods, with psychologist Dr Adam Bamel. That's at 5pm on Tuesday, the 9th of March, live on Microsoft Teams. If you're not a member of Queen's, you can get the link to join that event by signing up online, or you can find it on the Chapel Instagram page. And for members of the college, we will be concluding this season of Creation Justice with an opportunity for discussion on these themes of faith and the environment, structured roughly around Ruth Valerio's book, Saying Yes to Life. You don't need to have read it to join in the discussion, but you can find some free copies in the chapel or download it yourself at home. That will be one evening this week and I will send out details by email and on social media. Let us pray. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. Amen.